just want to invite you to take a little tour for a moment. Go from Genesis to Malachi, skip the New Testament, and read the book of Revelation and watch what happens. If you're Jewish, you will understand more easily, quick, out of the book of Revelation than most of us Gentiles who read it several times. You got to know the old. His revelation is unmatched. Number one, look at it in verse 8. The Messiah has to be eternal in his purpose. Who is the Messiah? What is this vision of the Messiah? Well, number one, the Bible teaches us that he's got to be eternal in his person. It, he says there in verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord. What an awesome statement. First of all, that declaration, I am, the ego emi. This takes us right back to Moses' encounter with God on the mount at the burning bush, the great I am. When Moses said, as I go back to the children of Israel to speak and tell them who sent me, what do I say to them? And God said to them, you tell them I am that I am sent you. And that name of God is the self-contained, eternal, existing one. You know, seven times, I'm not going to give you the verses uh, right now, you can look them up later, but seven times in the book of John, John's gospel, seven times, Jesus declares that he is the I am. A lot of people today will say, Jesus never claimed to be God. That is absolutely false. Not only did he claim to be God, he gave clear specifics as to why he is God. The great I am. He says, I am the Alpha. That statement is an, an announcement that he is the, the first of the Greek alphabet, alpha. Meaning that in him, all revelation of truth exists. That he's the source, he's the beginning of all that. Then he says that he is the omega. That is the conclusion, the last alphabet of the Greek language. That all revelation of insight, wisdom, and knowledge, and truth is wrapped up in Jesus Christ. When Jesus says, here in the Bible... I am the Alpha and the Omega. All of a sudden, Jesus Christ is set out and apart from all others who claim to be the way. There's no other revelation like him. And there's not going to be. Unmatched. The Bible stands alone. When you talk about the Alpha and the Omega, you're talking about these things announcing that Jesus Christ is in fact the final word. It goes on to say, I am the beginning and I am the end. The beginning. Jesus is the beginning, listen, of all creation. The word, the Bible tells us that this Jesus who was the Messiah before creation, the physical universe ever existed, Jesus was there. Jesus is not created. He's the uncreated cause for creation. The Bible again over and over. We read it a moment ago that he's the firstborn. He's the preeminent one. Just think of this. How old are angels? <laughs> Nobody knows. But do you know what your Bible says about who created angels? The Bible says Jesus created angels. He's the creator of angels. Before all or any thing at all was created, Christ was there in eternity. He's unmatched in his revelation because he is, in fact, eternal in his person. This is the Jesus that saves your soul. This is the Jesus that rescues us. The revelation of Jesus Christ is the announcement that he's given us. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 1 Timothy 3, 16. Without controversy, Paul tells Timothy, great is the mystery of godliness. Without controversy, without debate, the mystery of godliness has been revealed. This mysterion, it doesn't mean that you can't know it. It means that it's always been, but now it's being revealed. Think about that. Just as Jesus, as it were, the statue is being lifted, the, the canvas is being lifted, and there's the image. Well, in this book, Jesus is being revealed, and the canvas of our eyes, as it were, is being lifted. Paul puts it this way to Timothy. That there's no victory in controversy or debate. This is the fact. The mystery of godliness is this. That God was manifested in the flesh. That's a deity statement, friends, about Jesus. 
Do you have any friends who don't believe that Jesus is God? Have them explain that. God was manifest. God was seen in the flesh. Number two, justified in the spirit. The Holy Spirit was upon Christ. The Holy Spirit empowered him when he was on earth. Everything Jesus did, he did by the power of God, the Holy Spirit. Next, seen by angels, which is a remarkable statement. Seen by angels. The word, we get the word gawk to be wide-eyed. The word seen by angels. It implies, listen everyone, that in the presence of God in heaven prior to the incarnation of Christ in, into this world, check this out, that it appears that when angels appeared before God in heaven, you read that they do appear, but their faces are veiled and their bodies covered by their wings. The Bible tells us that before the throne of the Lord, the seraphim uh, are there, and the Bible tells us that they have uh, three sets of wings, six wings, three sets, and it says with two wings, they cover their face, with two wings, they cover their bodies, and with two wings, they fly in the presence of God, and they say, holy, 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 day and night forever. It is believed by some, and I happen to be part of that some. I just think it's incredibly romantic, and I like it, that when angels appear before God, they veil themselves. And then at the birthing of Jesus, when Mary was there giving birth to this little lamb that was to take away our sins, angels gawked. Perhaps it's the first time they were able to see their creator coming into the world experiencing the unthinkable, taking upon himself, not the form of an angel, but the form of a human being. And that when Mary was giving birth, I mean, with, I mean this with all due respect, Mary's giving birth, and those angels had to be just absolutely going, do you see this? Can you see this? There he is. That's the one that made us. He's the one that we've been singing to. That's the one that made us live. He's the one that we bow to. That's the one we serve. Look at him. They got. I, listen, I submit to you today that to cause an angel to be impressed is not easy. <laughs> they gawked. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 3.16 that he was preached among the Gentiles. I love that. That name goes all around the world. Hallelujah. Right, church? Right now, you and I are living at a time where the gospel and the name of Christ is going all around the world. I thank God for this COVID crisis circus. Hey, it may be a complete whack nut thing going on in the world, but God's using it. God's using it. You say some people are using it for political purposes. Go ahead. I don't care. My God's using it to preach the gospel around the world. Everybody's hearing the gospel at the last moment. How, who would have ever thought that churches would be shut down and the gospel would get out more? Unbelievable miracle. And you're living it right now. You're living that. Absolutely remarkable. Believed on in the world and received up into glory. Did Christ leave this earth and go back to heaven? What a glorious statement that is. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. Hebrews 1 1 says, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past uh, to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom listen through whom also he made the worlds this is Jesus now verse 3 who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person you want to look at God look at Christ in the gospels what would God say about this Read Matthew. What would God do about that? Read Mark. Jesus was the incarnation of the revelation of God himself. John 1, of course. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. That's creation. That's what we're reading about here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Verse 14. And the Word became flesh, and tabernacled, dwelt, lived among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten, that is the only preeminent or glorified one of the Father, full of grace and truth. What amazing Jesus, the Messiah, 
unmatched in Revelation. Secondly, under this point is the Messiah has to be alone in his authority. God says, I share my glory with no other. The great I am, the Bible says here in Revelation 1.8 that he says that he is, he was, and he is to come the Almighty. In Revelation 4.8, the four living creatures, we touched on this a moment ago, having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. I have no idea what that means. I can't even imagine. I've got quite an imagination, and I cannot figure that one out. It's just got to be amazing. We're all going to see it, man. If you're trusting Jesus, you're going to see that thing. And we're going to look at it. See, that's what I read about. They do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. My friends, listen. That absolute authoritative statement is reserved only for God. If anyone else, even an angel, were to say, I am I'm the one who was, who is, who is to come, hell would, or heaven would eject them and cast them to hell. Jesus comes on the scene and invokes the very attribute of God's eternalness in all authority. Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of the Bible, unmatched in his revelation, alone in his authority. Revelation 11, verse 16 says, and the 24 elders, they represent the church, who sat before God on their thrones, fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty. And if you have any doubt, the one who is and who was and who is to what? Come. Are you guys sleeping? Are you okay? This is the Jesus. This is your God and Savior. This is the one who stands out and unique among all others. He's alone in his authority. Revelation 16, 5. I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be. Reserved only for God. Thirdly, under this point about his person being unmatched, in Revelation, that's who Jesus is. As we take a look at the vision of the Messiah, we learn in verse 10 that the Messiah has to be revealed in his word. That seems kind of redundant, but he's got to be revealed in his word. I'm going to ask you to get your pen ready or your camera ready or whatever, it, whatever you use to take notes because this is vitally important. When Jesus announces that he's the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, he says what you see, I love this, what you see, write it in a book. <laughs> hey, you have a Bible, can you hold it up for a second? Hold it up. Jesus said what you see, write it in a book. And that book is at the end of your Bible. It's the 66th book given. And uh, I love that because for me personally, that's Bible prophecy fulfilled. So get ready. He says, write this down. Write these things down. The argument. So if Jesus is the Messiah, how about this? Let's be sarcastic about it. Whoever the Messiah is, with whatever religious declarations there are out there in the world, let's take the claim of who Jesus is announced being in the New Testament and apply it against the Old Testament. That, I mean, where are we going to go? It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what continent or what religion you're involved in. You, you've got to go to the Bible. And if you don't go to the Bible, just check into a hotel and the Bible will come to you. <laughs> Open it up and ask yourself this question. Does this book talk about my gods or the God that I bow down to or the totem pole or the icon that I worship? You see, if Jesus is the Messiah, then there must be perfect correlation between the Old Testament revelation and the New Testament fulfillment. Who says? God says. Isn't it amazing? He's already done all the work. He asked us just to do the homework, to conclude. And you want to ask yourself this question. What have you concluded about Jesus? Is it, is it this? Is it this, my friend? Mark it down. Genesis 17, 1. 
Genesis 17, 1 says, says that the Almighty is God. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. You guys all got that? No problem, we got it. Well, Revelation 1, 7 says, Jesus here is called the Almighty. We read it. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him, a reference to the Jewish people, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen, here it comes. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, who is to come, the Almighty. My dear friends, in the grand trinity of God, listen, my Muslim friends, my Jewish friends, listen up. Christians do not worship three gods. We are monotheistic like you claim to be. This is a stumbling block for the Muslim community and for the Jewish community. You guys say Jesus is God. Yes, we do. You guys say the Holy Spirit's God. Yes, we do. You guys say the Father is God. Yes, we do. He is God, singular, Elohim, who manifests himself in three different yet correlating persons. And it's not a contradiction. He's one God. And he manifests himself in these three witnesses. I love the fact that the Bible says, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, truth shall be established. God is a witness unto himself. And he swears by himself. Genesis 17, 1 and Revelation 1, 7 and 8. You got to figure out who we're talking about here. Who is the Almighty? Who is this one who is or who was, who is and is to come? There can only be one. Exodus 3.14 says that the I am is God. For thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent you. Well, in John 8.58, Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. A go a me. Eternal God. By the way, if you think they didn't get it, the Bible says... When those Pharisees and the scribes heard that, they picked up stones to kill him. And Jesus said, whoa, whoa, wait, time out. Why are you going to kill me for doing these miracles? And and it's funny. They're almost like in the windup. They're right on the mound. And and he goes, wait, why are you doing this? And they stop. And they said, well, we're not going to do it because of the miracles. You can almost hear them. He goes, are you doing this because of all the miracles I've done? And they go, no, no, the miracles, Doug, they're not. We think a lot about the miracles. Those are nice. (laughs) Pretty fantastic. We must admit, we all agree the miracles are fantastic. No, it's not that. I'm not killing you for that. Because you, being a man, declare yourself to be God. That's the answer in the Bible. They say it. They understood. They got it. Isaiah 43 15 says that the Holy One is God. The Holy One is God. And if God is one, you can't have two. There's only one Holy One. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. There's only one. Acts 3.14 says, But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. A statement that they didn't want Jesus, they wanted Barabbas. Remember that, everybody? Here, the Bible declares that Jesus is none other than the Holy One. But you can only have one. Isaiah 43.10 says that the I Am, as we've mentioned before, is God. He says, you are my witnesses, Isaiah 43.10, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he Before me, there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. (laughs) John 8, 24, here's Jesus' correlation. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. This is who the Messiah is. This is the vision of the Messiah. This is the one who's being revealed in the book of Revelation. Isaiah 44, 6. The Bible tells us there that God says he's the first and the last. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. 
Are you, you guys need to, do you need coffee? I don't know about you. We need, this is amazing. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Messiah, the eternal God, my Savior. That's why your salvation is secure. Christ lives forever. This is why your salvation cannot be tampered with because he is your redeemer. It's not a man, it's not a system, it's not a church, it's not a movement, it's none other than God himself. Yeah. Revelation twenty-two thirteen 13 is correlation to Isaiah 44, 6. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. By the way, mark that down. Some of you have Bible versions that have deleted that from your Bible. It's Revelation twenty-two thirteen. You can check it right now or you can check it later. But some translations have removed it. They've used some of the Gnostic, uh, possibly Alexandrian uh, manuscripts, and they chose to excise the deity of Jesus right out of your Bible. Personally, I'm not joking. If your Bible publisher left out Revelation 22, 13, get a new Bible. Okay? Psalm 18, 31 says that God is the rock. For who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4 says, And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Wow. 1 Samuel 2.6. 1 Samuel 2.6 says that God raises the dead. The Lord kills and the Lord makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. John 5, 21. And as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. And Jesus went about to do that very thing. Isaiah 60, verse 19. Isaiah 60, verse 19, says that God is light. The sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor the brightness shall the moon give light to you. The Lord will be to you an everlasting light, and your God your glory. Verse 20, for sun shall no longer go down, nor shall your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and the days of your mourning shall be ended. Listen to what Jesus says. The correlation, John 8, 12. Then Jesus spoke to them and said, or saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Amen. Do you see who he is? The vision of the Messiah? There's no mistake. Are you worshiping the Jesus of the cults? Get away from him. He's man-made and man-defined. Or are you worshiping the Jesus of the Bible who, listen, is given by God to us who is God-defined? Big difference. Am I yelling? I'm so excited about this. I get pumped. Everything hangs on who Jesus is. If he's not who he is, we go home now. Eat, what's the old saying? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. But hallelujah, he is the Lord. And we live because of him. Joel 3. Joel 3, verse 12. Oh my goodness, we have to go fast. <laughs> Joel 3, verse 12 says that God is the judge. Let the nations be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. That's the great judgment at the last days. Well, listen to this. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd divides sheep from the goats. This is Jesus. Psalm 148 verse 5 says that God is the creator of angels. Let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and they were created. That's Psalm 148.5. Listen, this is a mic drop moment coming. Colossians 1, verse 16. For by him, that's Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Psalm, Psalm 148, verse 2. The Bible says that he's the creator of angels. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. 
Hebrews 1, 6. But when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. That's, by the way, fulfilled in 1 Timothy 3, 16. We read it a moment ago. Remember that? With the angels God? That's the answer. Jeremiah 31, 32. The Bible tells us there that there's one husband and he's God. Not according to the covenant that I made, God is speaking to them. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them uh, by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. The second Corinthians 11, 2 says, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. The Bible teaches us that God the Father is married to Israel and the Bible tells us that Christ is engaged to the church. Amen. Malachi 1 verse 6. There's one master and he's God. As son honors his father and as servant his master, if then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am the master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts. But look at John 13, 13. Jesus said, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so am I. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. There's only one master. There's only one Lord. Isaiah 40, verse 11. Isaiah 40, verse 11. Are you guys okay? I'm going as fast as I can. We're running out of time, so I'm going to go faster. Isaiah 40, 11, there's only one shepherd. He's God. It says there, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Jesus answers that in John 10, 16. And the Bible says, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. It's all of you, by the way. Them also I must bring. And they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. Isaiah 41, 14. There's only one redeemer. Fear not, you worm, Jacob. <laughs> you men of Israel, I will help you, says the Lord, and your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Answers to Luke 1, 68. Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. You can only have one. Deuteronomy 10, 17. The Bible says that God is the Lord of Lords. Deuteronomy 10, 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. Revelation 19, 16. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Wow, that's Jesus. That's God incarnate. It's amazing. Isaiah 45, 23. The Bible tells us that every knee will bow to God and God only. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return to me that to me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall take an oath. Philippians 2, 10. We read it a little while ago that every knee or that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. Wow. Genesis 1.1 says there's only one creator and that's God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Colossians 1.15 says he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones dominions or principalities or powers all things were created through him and for him and he is before all things and in him all things consist that's who he is the bible says in isaiah 45 21 there's only one savior and that's god tell and bring forth your case yes let them take counsel together who has declared it from ancient time and who has told it from that time have not I the Lord, and there is no other God besides me, a just God and Savior. There is none besides me. Acts 4.12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Listen, Isaiah 44, verse 6. Isaiah 44, verse 6. God is the King of Israel. 
Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am last. Besides me, there is no God. John 1, 49. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. There is no other. Pro oh, this is my favorite. This is where we end with this part. I've got eight minutes to finish the rest of everything else. This is the best. I've had Jews and I've had friends, Jews on the street that I bump into and Jews that I know well and long in life. This is where the yarmulke goes off the head. It just flies off like a Frisbee. <laughs> All these years, I've never had one Jew answer this verse. In fact, you need to pray for me. I'm going to be meeting up with another friend of mine who's a Jew pretty soon, and I'm going to be giving him this verse. And so I... I pray that the veil will be lifted from his eyes. Listen, if you're Jewish, for that matter, even if you're a Muslim, because all around the Dome of the Rock Mosque in Jerusalem, around that mosque, it says in Arabic, God is not begotten and God does not have a son. Why would Islam take the time? I mean, that's, that's prime real estate, man. You could have put something else up there. They, they put all around the Dome of the Rock Mosque in Arabic, God is not begotten, and God doesn't have a son. Why is Satan so concerned about people knowing that God has a son? Right? Think of it. Okay, here you go. Who has ascended into heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists, and who has bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if you know? Jesus. Guess what? Every Jew I've shared that with, they go, that, the Bible doesn't say that. I go, why don't you read it in Hebrew? Because I know something. I don't know Hebrew, like a Jew. But they'll look it up in Hebrew. And they go, oh, um, it's strong in English. It's stronger in Hebrew. <laughs> of course, because God speaks Hebrew. It makes sense. 1 John 4.15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Okay, listen, number two, uh, this is not going to work. I'm just going to keep going until the alarm goes off. It's terrible. Listen, regarding the vision of the Messiah, his message is universal to the church. His message all around the world for the last 2,000 years, his message is universal to the church, and it's this. The, ch the message of the Messiah and the vision of the Messiah is the announcement to the church is a message that saves. Not entertains, not plays games, saves. Amen. What shall it profit a man if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? Listen, the Messiah delivered a message that saves. Amen. The very vision of the Messiah was for him to come and give us the message, and that message is salvation. Secondly, when the Bible tells us, when he says what you see right in a book, I like to look at it this way, the Messiah's message is to ordain. You say, what do you mean by that? How many of you are Christians? Raise your hands. Raise your hand. Guess what? I believe the Bible literally ordains you to go in out all the world and preach this gospel to every creature. Every single one of us is given this message to announce to the ends of the earth. Well, wait a minute, Pastor. Isn't that what we pay you to do? No, it's not. We are all in the ministry. We Listen, we have been saved, and so we tell the world they can be saved. Listen, we've been ordained by the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. He sends us out. Listen, the, mission, the, the message is one that God wants deployed. He tells us right here in verse 10 that the announcement is given to the churches of Asia. And I don't want to belabor this. You'll probably hear more about it today. But all of these churches, seven of them mentioned, are, were not only geographical churches at the time, but there's a certain genius to announcing just these. But it is amazing that throughout the chronology of church history, the churches seem to mimic the descriptions of these various churches. And we are living, I believe, in the Laodicean period. The church, the church by and large universally around the earth is in a coma at least. Number three, verses 17 to 18 is this, as we see visions of the Messiah and asking the question, who is he? Is that his power is unequaled among all. 
verses 17 and 18. Do not be afraid, Jesus says. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys to hell and death. This is, oh my goodness, this is Jesus. Listen, Jehovah Witnesses, is that your Jesus? Oh no. This is not the Jesus of Mormonism. Go around the world. The Jesus that saves, the Jesus that is the Messiah of the world is the one who tasted death for all of us. He went into the grave. What kind of a Messiah would you want if the grave was never tested by the claims of that Messiah? Well, I'm following this group, this person. Have, have any of them died and then come back from the dead? By the way, after having an entire Old Testament written about them. <laughs> it's only Jesus. Amen. Friends, when you and I die, look, I've, we're Christians. We don't go to hell. We don't, we don't even see the grave. Listen, if, if we're really blessed, we could have a heart attack or something could rupture. We could drop dead before we hit the ground. That's an awesome day. Yeah. So how do, what do you mean? We're believers to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Our, we will not see the darkness of the grave. We go immediately to the presence of God because of what this great Savior has done for us. And so the church here is mentioned, churches, to be the, the unit, I put it that way, the organism by which we are deployed to the world. Number, th uh, number three, that is number three, unequaled among all. Look at this, the Messiah's power, the power in his promise. And I'm going to uh, end here pretty soon happy with this. When he says, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I thank God that God keeps his promises. My dear friend, listen today, the, the, the person with the greatest intentions still lacks the power to fulfill that promise that they gave you. You can have the most loving husband and wife stand up here and exchange vows and looking ahead, they could live 60 years and die of old age in love with one another. The truth of the matter is with all intent, the promise will still be broken somehow with the best intentions. Why? Because only God can keep a promise. And Jesus here is announcing to us that the power of what he says is in these promises. And the promises are powered by him. He says, I am he who lives and was dead. You say, boy, how do you, if, if you say Jesus died and Jesus is God, if Jesus is God and he died, then didn't, didn't the universe stop, to, stop existing? No. Because, friends, that's cute, but what died? When Jesus died, what died? Well, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Sin died at the, sin died at the cross, yes, okay. His, thank you, his body died. When Jesus died, his body died. Church, when Jesus died at the cross, did he cease to exist? No. no. His body died. He was that atoning offering. He atoned for us so that we might have forgiveness. That's what God had provided. The Messiah's power is his atonement. Thirdly, the Messiah's power is his victory. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. What a statement. And I have the keys of Hades or hell and death. And then here's where we end. Verses 19 to 20, his ministry is undeniably true. This is why Jesus is loved or hated. There's no gray area with him. The Messiah is the minister of time. Write these things which you have seen the things which are and the things which shall take place after this. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 tells us that the Messiah, when the Bible there says that the government shall rest upon his shoulders, remember that? It says that uh, he will be... Time's up. <laughs> Time's up. The Bible tells us that uh, he will be the, the, the father, the word is father of time, the governor of time. Jesus is the governor of time. Yeah, I know. We're, we're all working on that. Jesus is the minister of time. Well, I don't know. We're reading the book of Revelation.
salvation and he hasn't come yet. And I'm losing patience. Calm down. He's the minister of time. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's also the minister of men. When I say men, I mean this in verse 20. The minister of men. It says the mystery of the seven stars. The seven stars are, are seven pastors or spokesmen for these churches, which you saw in my right hand. He goes on to say the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. I personally believe that the seven angels are not angelic angels, but they are, angel they are the messengers of those churches. What I'm saying is this, and, and when I get done saying this, I'm going to need to run out of here because I'll be in trouble. And that is, God, Jesus is the minister of men. Jesus occupies the pulpit. And when the pulpit goes wayward, uh, Jesus enters in to rescue those that are called by his name. And, and today and all around the world, there are compromised pulpits and compromised ministers. They do not have boldness because they have things going on in their life that uh, they need to deal with. They, or there's fear. Or there's, listen, out of all the people in the world right now, the minister that is under the power of God ought not to fear. How in the world can we encourage God's people? Don't fear. Be of good courage when we're hiding. How can we be God's ministers when we say, trust in the Lord with all your heart, when we don't do it? How can we be God's ministers when we shut the doors and Jesus said, behold, I set before you an open door? How can we be God's ministers? We've got to listen to him. The Messiah is the minister of his church. All of us as pastors and Christian workers, it is the Messiah who is the minister of his church. Not us. We're sheepdogs at best. It's his church. Amen. The seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. And I'm going to end with this right here, right now, and it's over. Lampstands. Lampstands. You all know what a lampstand's all about. I mean, we our lampstands, now we throw a switch. There's, we don't use lampstands. But, you know, on that foyer, there's a 59-pound solid bronze Menorah, seven lampstands in that foyer, hand carried over from Israel, built in 1954, I think it was, coming out of a rock, an uncut rock, 2,011 pound uncut stone, knocked out of a hillside in Jerusalem, and it's there to remind every single one of us that go in and out of this church that Jesus is the cornerstone, Jesus is the rock, and the witness is he walks in the midst of the lampstands. He judges the churches. Jesus, and the greatest thing that you and I need to do at this hour is to maintain the light. Amen. Make sure the Holy Spirit has full control of your life. Be in the word of God. Listen, ask him to be your empowerment every day. Christ is coming back for a holy church, a church that is clean, a church that is looking. It doesn't mean we're sinless. It means that we are walking with him, and as we walk with him, we have fellowship one with, an, one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. We walk with him. He's coming. Don't let your lamp go out. He's coming. Don't let the oil go low. He's coming. So we are the light of truth to the world around us. God bless you guys very, very much. Sorry. <clears throat> I have no idea how to stop him. <laughs> so don't come up and talk to me about it. I was thrilled to hear what he had to say. Now, you'll probably want to run over there to the gymnasium, to all of our resources, or you can pick them up later. Don't forget, we have a nice lunch break time. And next on the list is Dr. Ed Heinsen. So, when you hear the music, you'll know we're getting ready to come back. God bless you. Now, oh, one other thing. I had several people say, how do we save our seat? I have no idea. <laughs> May God help you to figure that out. Okay, I'll see you in a little bit. God bless you.